in God's house, and we're going to sing a hymn, hymn of praise unto God. It's a hymn 110, Mr. Wesley's great hymn, O Love Divine. What hast thou done? The immortal God hath died for me, the flowers co, eternal sun, for all my sins. Upon the tree, the immortal God for me hath died, my Lord, my love, is crucified. The hymn 110, after the note will stand. The singing was very good this morning, and I am sure we can sing as well again tonight. The hymn 110, please. singing of a lovely gospel hymn. We're going to seek the Lord now in prayer. Let's try and stow our hearts before him. It's of course a gospel meeting and in a gospel meeting we are very conscious indeed in all meetings of our need to have the Lord with us tonight and let's pray for the preaching of the word as we were encouraged this morning and exhorted to pray that it made a free course and be glorified. Our Heavenly Father, once again, in the precious name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, we come even this night to seek thy face. Within the veil we bow the knee, 
Lord, let thy glory fill this place and bless us while we wait in thee. We bring no merit of our own, Lord, before thee, for we have none to bring. Conscious tonight that all our righteousnesses in and of themselves are but filthy and repulsive rides, Lord, in your sight. But we're so glad that we have the righteousness of another imputed to us. We say tonight upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, an hour's life and an hour's death I stake my whole eternity. And that hour, of course, is I, Son, our Saviour, where there's no salvation in any other, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We recognise him as we did this morning in prayer, as the one mediator between God and men. We remember that he said, I am the door. We note, Lord, how he used the singular on all those occasions. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. And we're glad, Lord, that we have a great message to preach tonight, a great gospel to preach, the gospel of Christ himself, which is the power of of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. We're praying for any that are gathered with us even this night who are still unconverted and unsaved. Oh, we want this night to be the night when those arms of surrender are raised up, when there's that coming to the Saviour, when there is the, the, the shepherd returning, having found the sheep that was lost. Lord, we pray that you'll grant such even to the meeting tonight. We pray for the restoration of the backslidden. Lord, we know how, how easy it is to backslide. We don't doubt, Lord, the salvation of backsliders, but we can bring them no comfort except they return to the Lord, except there is that coming to him afresh, that, that, that returning. Think of how the Lord said, speaking to backslidden Israel, return unto me, and I will return unto you. May that be the case with any gathered here. Lord, who have wandered away, got away from the Lord. And as for your people, Father, those of us, Lord, who are trying to press on towards the mark for the praise of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, we have a desire to hear the Lord say to us at the end, even though we are, Lord, unprofitable servants, yet Lord, we, our great desire is that the Lord would say to us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, that's our goal tonight, the Lord, to press on towards the mark, and to live a life for the Lord, to be like Job. Think of, Lord, how you spoke to the very devil himself. He had nothing but scorn and hatred. The accuser of the brethren, hast thou considered my righteous servant Job? May we be those righteous servants of the Lord. Lord, revive us again, that thy people might rejoice in thee. And what we would pray for ourselves tonight, we would pray for every other evangelical meeting house, where Christ is named, where the book will be opened, the hymns sung, the book opened, Christ preached in all his fullness. Lord, we're praying that all over our little land tonight, oh, how far gone the Lord is our little land from former days, and yet there is a remnant, we believe, according to the election of grace. And we're praying, Father, that there will be an ear given to many people to hear tonight, where words whereby they and their houses can be saved. Thank you for your help this morning. We ask for it. We said, ask, and it shall be given. We took you, Lord, at your word. You were faithful and true. And, Lord, we're just asking again, give us our great sense of your presence. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we turn in our Bibles, please, uh, to the book of Acts and the chapter 16. The book of Acts and the chapter 16. It's quite a long chapter. So we are going to confine ourselves to the reading of the verse 1 at the commencement of the chapter down to the end of the verse 15. 
<coughs> Acts chapter 16, commencing our reading at verse 1 and reading down to the verse 15. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear the word of the Lord. Then came he, it is of course the Apostle Paul, then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman who was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. Which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. For they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they assay, they said to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavoured to go in to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothrakia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women, which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Go into reading there at the verse 15, and we look to the Lord as we do to bless, particularly the reading of his word. We want to ask our brother Jackie. Jackie Alistair, can you come please again? Bring the announcements to us. Well, it's good to see you all tonight again uh, out of the house of God. We do bid you welcome in the Saviour's name. If you're visiting with us, uh, then a very special welcome uh, to you uh, to our service this evening. And of course, again, we're glad to have our brother, Mr. Colin Maxwell, with us in the pulpit. He's been with us throughout the day, and we uh, have enjoyed his ministry this morning. And we do pray it again that the Lord will give him that help from himself this evening as he opens up the word of God. Uh, do remember the meetings during the week, just the two meetings really during the holiday months, uh, and that's our Tuesday uh, prayer meeting, 8 p.m. on Tuesday evening, and this week our brother Mr. Colin McKee will be responsible for that meeting. And then on Friday, the 10th, uh, Friday at 10 p.m. Uh, we have our men's prayer meeting going ahead as usual. Next Lord's Day, the services at the normal times of half past 11 and seven o'clock 
our brother, Mr. Noel Shields, another of her brethren who work under our mission board, uh, will be with us uh, next Lord's Day for both those services. Uh, and of course, in the afternoon, weather permitting, we will have our open air service uh, in the town somewhere at 3 p.m. Uh, it is the second Lord's Day of the month, and as you know, we take up our monthly missionary offering on that Sunday. Uh, so the, the missionary offering will be taken up next Lord's Day, and this month that offering will go to the Missionary Council uh, of our denomination. So do uh, keep that in mind, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, brother, for bringing the announcements. Good to be with you again tonight and uh, to, to preach the gospel of the grace of God. 339, <coughs> excuse me, 339 is our second hymn to sing. Found in page 313. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget after I wandered in darkness away. Jesus, my Saviour. I met. It's a great testimony hymn, isn't it? And certainly those that are gathered among us tonight that are saved, we can say, yes, it was a wonderful day, a day we will never forget. 339, remain seated for the first part of the hymn, please, and uh, 339. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful day We'll never forget After I wandered in darkness away Jesus, my Savior, I met
Amen. Let's turn again, please, to the Word of God that we read together. We read Acts chapter 16, the first 15 verses. And tonight we want to think of our text, the words of verse 14. It says, There was a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. And it says of her, she was of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, these preachers, Paul and his companions, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. We'll seek the Lord again. Father, thank you for being able to sing these hymns. We, we love to sing hymns. You've put a new song in our mouth, even praise on to our God. And it's good, Lord, to be familiar with the hymns that we have. These are good hymns. And, Lord, how in the singing of them we, we can lift our spirits. And it might be that others will hear it and even desire to have what we have in Christ. But, Lord, the need of the hour now is for the preacher to know that gracious and powerful and filling of the Spirit of God, that the word tonight come not in word only, but in power and in demonstration of the Spirit. Let it not fall idly to the ground. Let not the birds of the air pluck it away, as they are wont to do when the gospel is preached. But let the good seed fall on the good ground and bring forth fruit even this night, some thirty, some sixty, and some one hundredfold. And all, oh Lord, to your glory. For we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The word conversion is not uniquely a religious word. People outside, outside the church, maybe never would darken the door of a church, they might speak of converting their garden sheds or maybe their roof space into a games room. So they get rid of all the, the stuff that's not needed. And then goes maybe the snooker table or whatever. Or maybe they, they decide, and the language they will use is this, we're going to convert our heating. Maybe this will be a thing of the past, heating, uh, the way things are going. But on a better day, when they weren't ripping us off, uh, they said, well, we're going to convert from heating our house by oil. And we're going over to gas, the North Sea stuff. And that, that's a language that they use. It primarily means just to change, to convert from one state to another. In religious circles, it may simply mean to swap one set of beliefs for another. Some people convert from the religion of their birth to that of the one whom they intend to marry. They hang their hat, as we would say, in a different place of worship. And they espouse new and even now opposing views and doctrines to that which they once held. But when the Bible speaks about conversion, let's get to the point tonight, then it means much more than obviously making, a room, making room for a snooker table. Or even much more than swapping one religious stance for another. It was the Lord Jesus himself who said, making what we might call a very fundamental, a very important and unforgettable statement. He said concerning conversion, listen to what he said, except ye be converted, and except ye become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. The unconverted will not be permitted to step over the threshold of heaven. Instead, the Bible says very clearly, and again and again, such will be cast out in the outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Maybe someone, perhaps even here tonight, might say, well, I don't concern myself with these things. Well, that might be so, and of course, humanly speaking, 
In our society, that's your prerogative. But please remember, that's not the end of the story. Because these things concern themselves with you. And you're in the mix tonight. Whether you agree with it or not, you're in the mix because you are a creature. A creature of God. And you are answerable to your great creator who created you. The God in whose hand, the scripture says, thy breath is. And what we want to do tonight in order to grasp both the importance and the nature of Christian conversion, that is being converted, not merely to a church, not to a denomination, but being converted to Jesus Christ. The importance of that, that's where we're heading tonight. We want to look at what we might call a case history. Here we have the conversion of this woman who was called Lydia. We have some details of Lydia given there. <coughs> Verses 13 right through to verse 15. Verse 14 where we are. Obviously, obviously, some of her personal details will differ from ours. She lived in a different age. She lived in a different place. She had a different background. But we have here, for all that, the fundamentals, the things that must be there of the conversion to Christ experience. Again, I remind you, let me underline it tonight, how necessary it is to enter into the kingdom of God. It's not just the preferred route. It's not just the recommended route, as if there was another. The only way in which a man, a woman, or a boy, or girl will get into heaven is being converted to Jesus Christ. And we have a little hymn that says, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. And I'll ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I, I miss. number of things that we want to see tonight in the passage the first thing that we want to see, and we're basing this in verse 13, we're really telling the story tonight. The first thing that is very noticeable, number one, is this. The meeting, the meeting which Lydia attended. Just as you are here tonight in the meeting, somebody says to you tomorrow, well, what did you do last night? I went to the meeting in Cumber Free Presbyterian Church. Or they might say, were you at the meeting last night? Yes, I was there. Well, here's a meeting that Lydia was in attendance at. And we notice here that it's not primarily a Christian meeting. Not yet. Evidently, it had been established for a little while. It was a place, we read there, where prayer was wont to be made. There was a habit here, a custom here, a, a tradition here of a prayer meeting. It had been going for a little while. But until the Apostle Paul turned up on the doorstep, here was a meeting whereby those in attendance were largely ignorant of the recent arrival of New Testament Christianity on the block. It was a Jewish meeting. They were not meeting in a synagogue. You see, when the Apostle Paul went into different towns, he always asked, Where's the synagogue? Where do the Jews meet? And when he comes here, he, he discovers that there was no synagogue. You needed quite a number of men present, not just women, but men present to constitute a synagogue. And there was evidently not enough men. There were just ladies. Well, let's give credit where it's due tonight. I think it's always a good thing to do. These ladies did what they could. They might not have had Bibles at this time. That would have been the Old Testament scrolls. I'm sure you've seen pictures of them in various places. But the very fact that they prayed together, just offering up prayer unto God, perhaps even in the Hebrew tongue, I don't know, but they, they prayed. It would indicate that they had a fair knowledge. Let's put it at that. A fair knowledge, a working knowledge of the one true and living God. Because it's a very vital element in prayer that we pray with the understanding 
also. That's why as a church, we don't go down the line of speaking in tongues. If nobody knows what's been said, this was the argument of Paul, how can we amen it? How can you put your rubber stamp on it and ask God to do what has been said if you haven't a clue what has been asked for? Well, these women, I believe, would have prayed with the understanding also. I believe they would have been most familiar with the psalms. We sang a psalm this morning, did we not? And it might well be. We're not given that much detail, but I don't think we're going to trump in anybody's toes here in saying that it might well have been that the ladies sang a few of the psalms together, just as we did this morning. It appears to me, my impression, that it was a small meeting. I, I, I don't envisage this. I, I, I get a little picture in my mind. I see the riverside. I see the trees here uh, along the riverside. They're meeting under the shelter of the tree. They're out of the city just a little bit and uh, away from the bustle and so on. I, I just see a small meeting here. I, I'm not going to put a number on it, but I don't see many gathered. I think it would have been a meeting that was largely ignored, certainly tolerated, for which we would have to rejoice, but largely ignored by ours in Philippi. We're given a little bit of detail about Philippi there. Verse 12, it was a chief city of that part of Macedonia, and it was a colony. It was a place of great importance. And even here on the Sabbath day, for the Bible says it was the Sabbath, and of course, that would have been the Jewish Sabbath. That wasn't a Sunday, this was a Saturday the Jewish Sabbath at this time. These other people would have been going about their business just the way in this Christian Sabbath. The car parks are full in the shopping centres and little or no thought of God and certainly no attending at the meeting. But here was a meeting that was noted of God. There is an all-seeing eye with favour looking upon this meeting. I know it was small, in my impression, and probably lacking in so much, it became a means of grace. A means of grace, something that God had purposed to bring about, to use to bring about the conversion to this woman Lydia, so that she could enter into the kingdom of heaven. This meeting here and now in Cumber may yet prove to be a means of grace. We've been praying that it will be so. Let me nail the colours to the Mass tonight. <coughs> we're preaching. We're preaching for souls. The Lord wants us to be fishers of men. As what he said to Peter, you have been catching fish, Peter. Henceforth, from now on, follow me. I will make you to be fishers of men. And we're preaching for souls. We're preaching that people may be converted. It would uplift this meeting. We'd all go home rejoicing as God's people if we thought of someone waiting behind and coming to know Christ as their Savior. You see, God not only ordains the end, his purposes, but the means to that end. And that's why there are meetings, means of grace. And those who are serious about meeting God, and meeting God as one day we all must do, but meeting him in that state of reconciliation. The hymn writer said, My God is reconciled. His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me as his child. Why should I longer fear? Meeting him in a state of reconciliation as opposed to meeting him in a state of wrath. But those that are serious about meeting God do well to be in those places where they are most likely to encounter God. It's good to be around Christians because the Lord said where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am, there am I in the midst of them. It would not make sense with it tonight to say that you're seeking God and yet going to a godless rock concert going to a disco, standing outside a nightclub that promotes all kinds of satanic things. And while God is sovereign, we can't pigeonhole God, yet we are a responsible people. 
And common sense itself would tell us to be in a place where prayer is want to be made. This, this is the meeting she attended. And then we notice a little further as we look at the story again. As we have it recorded here, Luke is a historian. He was a doctor, but he could put facts together. He gives us here, secondly, the preacher that she encountered. The preacher that she encountered. Because if Lydia is seeking God, and surely her attendance at this place of prayer would indicate so, then it may be clearly seen also that God was seeking her. And so was Paul. Because even though there's no record that he had ever met this woman, yet he is on the lookout for souls. He is the God-sent missionary to Philippi. As we read there in the early part of the passage, the Apostle Paul, as much as he was uh, giving himself to the work of God, trying to discern the Lord's will, he initially had our plans uh, to go elsewhere. Look there at verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, Paul feels that we should start knocking doors down here, that we should maybe get into the synagogue down here, get meetings going down here, talk to people in the marketplace down here. But look what happened in verse 6. We were forbidden, forbidden by the Holy Ghost. There's a divine intervention here. God has said, Paul, you're not to go there at this time. I don't want you to preach the word in Asia. And now they're coming, verse 7, in to Messiah. And they have said, that just means they attempted, they tried to go into Bithynia once again. The door's closed. God says, no, it's the Spirit again who suffered them not. They, they kept getting frustrated, not, not by the devil. Now, that's complained of over in First Thessalonians 2 and 18. We tried to come to you now and again. But Satan hindered us. But not here. It's the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God says, no, I want you. I want you to go to Philippi. He gets this vision in the night. This man of Macedonia praying, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And it says immediately, verse 10, we endeavoured to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. And eventually they make it there, they make it there down, down to Philippi. And you can see how this means of grace works, can't you there? Paul wants us to reach sinners. Doesn't want to go to Philippi, colony though it be, spend days sitting in the library or learning the history of the place. Now he goes to where sinners are found. And in this case, as, as he had a habit of doing, he goes to find the religious sinners. He may be asked, is there a synagogue? And somebody said, no, there's not. Not enough of them about the place. But there are some ladies down there. And they speak in this sort of foreign tongue and I think they're Jews. And that's where Paul went. You know, if the sinner wants to find God's man, and through his ministry wants to meet God, again, let them all go to this mutual place. And that's what we have here, a prayer meeting. A Sabbath prayer meeting. A place known where people can meet and gather. And what a preacher there was to turn up unannounced. The mighty Apostle Paul. With all due respects to the other, we might say we would suppose Paul to be the greatest of the Apostles. We admire Peter, we love John, James, Philip, Bartholomew, and so on. But here's a man who wrote about a dozen inspired epistles. Here's a man who is, is full of, of missionary seed. Here's a man who is crushed with a great burden, a great love for the souls of men. One who would eventually be martyred for his faith. What a, what a preacher to turn up. And yet, and yet tonight, let us not get carried away with the preacher. Certainly the Apostle Paul would not like to have any undue attention. 
And you'll not find apostles today. You'll find guys who think they're apostles, but they're not. But what we have this night is access to the writings of the apostles. We have the New Testament. And these are the things that are to be expounded. You listen to a man, if you've got a discerning ear, you listen to a man who preaches apostolic truth. It was said of the men of Athens. Remember Paul went to Athens. It's in the next chapter. He went to Thessalonica in the early part, but he ended up in Athens. And it says the men of Athens were forever chasing after something that was new. They, they were like spoiled children. You could keep their attention just for a little while, but oh, so quickly something else came and they left you. You couldn't rely on them. It's the gospel of Christ alone. It is the power of God on the salvation. And the gospel of Christ does not need to be changed. And it does not need to be updated. One of the titles of the gospel is that it is the everlasting gospel. It doesn't need to be changed. It doesn't need to be adapted. It just needs to be preached. And if you attend meetings and you ascertain that this old gospel message, founded on and agreeable to the word of God, is not been made clear, if you're coming out confused, if you're coming out wondering why on earth you went in, then, then I say, look somewhere else. Because you're not in the place where God wants you to be. Oh, how thankful we are here of this meeting that Lydia attended and the preacher she met. She encountered a man who fervently believed in the preaching of the Bible. We see here thirdly the Christ she discovered. The Christ she discovered. We're not actually told here what Paul actually said. We don't have a little account of his sermon. We know, of course, what he said in Athens, where we have it recorded for us. But we're not told. Just that he spoke things which were spoken of Paul. There are no sermon notes left behind. There's no little outline. Basically, that we could take and preach elsewhere. But we're not left in the dark here, are we? Because the Apostle Paul described his sermon content elsewhere. He's in trial in Acts chapter 26, verse 22, and he gives a little word of testimony. And he says, having obtained help of God, having obtained help of God, I continue on to this day witnessing both the small groups, just like here, small and great, saying none other things than those which Moses and the prophets and Moses to say should come. He preached the Old Testament. He, he applied the Old Testament. Again, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, We preach not ourselves. If ever a man could have preached about his great attainments, it was this man, Paul. But no, we wouldn't do it. We preach not ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord. And when he went to Corinth, as he did in chapter 18, he records that and he says, I determined, here's a determinant man, a steadfast man, I determined not to know anything among you. I'm not going to get into your politics. I'm not going to give you economic ways out of the Great Depression and all this. I'm not going to tell you how to run your business. No, I am determined to know nothing among you. Save Christ and him crucified. All my preaching, we're going to come back to the cross. And we're going to gaze by faith on the Son of God who went to the cross and who gave himself a ransom for many. It's not hard to work it all out, is it, here, what he said. I believe Lydia sitting there in this meeting of all meetings, in this day of all days, she would have learned something. She would have learned how far short she came of the glory of God. Maybe this woman preened herself how religious she was. Here she is keeping the Sabbath. She's a seller of purple. You say, what does that mean? Well, purple was very expensive clothing. It's a businesswoman here. 
And perhaps the Sabbath day was maybe the best day of the week in which to open up her shop and make another fortune, another day. But she closed her shop. But she didn't, or if she preened herself in that and thought that by keeping the law, she could get right with God. She was soon disabused of that. Because the law was given not to show us how good we are. Many people do hear, well, I try my best. I try to keep the commandments. The commandments of God are not a ten-rung letter to take you to heaven. They weren't given so that you can pride yourself on how good you are. You understand the law of God aright. By the law is the knowledge of sin. The law of God was there to bring you down from your high horse and to cast you into the dust as a sinner before God. She learned how unable she was to save herself, religious or not. And then she learned what God had graciously done to secure her salvation. She would have learned this in the words of Galatians 4, verse 4, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law. And he would have told her the simple story of the cross, one day when heaven was filled with his glory, and one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt amongst men, my Redeemer is he. And then he would have went on, and he would have said, one day they took him to Calvary's mountain, and one day they nailed him to the tree. Oh, the great atoning work and the vicarious work of Christ. The hymn writer said, The wrath of God that was our due upon the Lamb was laid by the shedding of his blood. The debt for us was paid. He would have preached the glorious resurrection. Maybe he could see these women folks sitting there. Maybe some of them weeping as they, they think of the Son of God nailed to the cross. It's a, in many ways, it's a sad story. But it's a victorious story because he would have went on. And he might have said them, but you know what happened on the third day? He rose again and triumphed from the grave. He's a risen Savior, able to save to the uttermost. All that come on to God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. And the way of salvation by grace, unmerited favor of God, by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. Oh, let's get that into our minds tonight. That not of ourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He would have sought to persuade his hearers to personally embrace Christ he would not have used those enticing words of man's wisdom. He's not a salesman tonight. But he would have used the most biblical of reasoning. Here's why you need to be saved. This is why you need to be saved now. And he sat it down the line. It was so Christ-centered. And if this woman was in any way educated in her own scriptures of the Old Testament... This would have made sense. This would have unlocked the Scriptures to her. Because Christ is the key of the Scriptures. Don't you look at the Bible and think it's just a, a book of moral codes. Don't you look at the Bible and say, it's, it's a history book. Oh, it's very exciting in places. And I love reading about uh, the, these people called the Jews and how they wandered and got into Israel or into Egypt and God brought them out and very exciting reading. Jesus said, search the scriptures. Why should we search the scriptures, Jesus? Because they testify of me. What a glorious day it was, the Christ she discovered. We see here, fourthly, moving on, we have here the grace she experienced. The grace she experienced. What happened when she heard this man preach? When Paul preached, whose heart the Lord opened. This is what we call regeneration. 
being born again. We sang that tonight, born of the Spirit, with life from above, into God's family divine. You see, sin shuts the heart against God. When our Lord came into the world, the Bible says he came into the world, the world was made by him, the world knew him not. He came unto his own, that is, the Jews. For it's evident that he sprang from the tribe of Judah. He came unto his own. His own received them not. There was a, a hardening of the heart against them. They saw no beauty in him that they should desire him. Isaiah chapter 53. And you see, the heart's door tonight, the heart's door is firmly locked against the Son of God. I looked up in my study the sermon, I suppose it was, or certainly the essay that was written by a Mr. Buchanan, one of the great Scottish preachers of the 19th century, a Presbyterian preacher in Scotland, a friend of McShane. And he, and, and he gave us a great job here. And this isn't religionism tonight. I'm telling you where I got it from. But he, he showed many of the bars that are there, the snibs, as we would say, the bars that are there that keep this door shut. The Lord opened our heart. Our heart up to now had been closed. He says, of course, there is the bar of unbelief. The bar of unbelief. That's the chief bar, isn't it? Where there is no believing of the record that God has given off his son. Again, we put the words earlier on where people say, I don't concern myself about these things. Why not? Because basically I don't believe they're true. They're not true enough, certainly for me. To be bowered. Unbelief, enmity, is another bar. The carnal mind, enmity, at war against God. Then there is presumption or pride. It says in Psalm 10, the wicked, the wicked through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not. In all his thoughts. There's a bar perhaps of discouragement and despair. Thou sayest, there is no hope, for I have loved strangers, and after them I will go. Despair. There's unwillingness. Jesus said, ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. There's worldly mindedness. The thorns that choke the seed in the parable of the sower. And there's the bar of sloth. A little more sleep. A little more slumber. A little folding of the hands to sleep. There's vicious passions at work there to pray of lusts, to be carnally minded as death. Any one of which can snub the door against Christ and keep him out. We're not told which or how many of these bars the Lord, that is the Spirit of God, had to so powerfully draw back. For it was the Lord who opened her heart. But none remained. Oh, here is sovereign grace at work tonight. You see, man cannot open his own heart's door. He's not stronger. He's not stronger than the devil. He has shut the door of the heart. The devil has done it. He has blinded the minds of them who believe not. And an unregenerate man cannot overcome the devil. To open the door of his heart. To receive the Savior in, but for this cause. For this cause the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And this is the work of God graciously changing the disposition of the heart, the grace he experienced. Fifthly and lastly, the response he rendered. The Lord opened our heart that in order that she might attend to the things which were spoken by Paul. You see, the Spirit and the book go hand in hand. And regeneration tonight is the sovereign work of the Spirit of God. If we had time, we would go over to Nicodemus, wouldn't we, in John chapter 3. The wind blowing where it listeth. Hear the sound thereof, big rushing mighty wind. Here's the sound thereof. But you can't tell whence it cometh. Yes, you know what direction it's coming in coming this way, it's coming, what, east or west or whatever, but, but nevertheless, it's, it's a mysterious work. Cannot tell whence it cometh, where it goeth, so is every one born of the Spirit. But we know this, conversion is the result. 
The first and infallible sign of the new birth is the newborn crying out unto the Lord for salvation. Come unto his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born, not of the flesh, not of the will of man even, but born of God, born of God. Who is it that believeth that Jesus is the Christ? The man, the woman that is born of God. Let me use what I believe is a helpful little illustration tonight. You have someone drowning in the river. We're not that far from the lock, are we? We're maybe out along the shore and someone's drowning. Okay, well, maybe you, you can dive in and rescue them, but you need to be a strong a swimmer and know what you're doing. Because you get dive in and two of you be drowned. So you don't want that. But there's a life boy. Some idiot hasn't thrown it away. It's still there. And you throw it out to him on a rope. Now, do you have to explain to that man all, all, all the science behind that? How, how a, a plastic type ring, if he just lays hold on it and you can pull him in, do you have to explain all the science behind the, the ability of that life boy, not only to float itself, but to support him also. Do, does, he, does he need a degree in physics before he has any right to lay hold upon it and be rescued? Or does he just trust the life boy? Does he just grab it for dear life and be brought to the shore? Well, common sense, of course, with the back in the scripture says, just grab it. Just lay hold on it. You can go and learn all the science afterwards if you want. Get a degree in physics. And tonight we say this. Christ is the only saviour you need. Christ is the only saviour you can have. And his great work upon the cross, a finished work, that's what he cried. Take him at his word tonight. Finished work is sufficient to save you. You lay hold on him. You trust him tonight. Even where you're sitting in your pew. You want to speak to me afterwards? Yes, I'll, I'll be around. I'm in no big hurry home. But you know, just sitting where you are in the pew, in your heart you can call upon him. Tell him you're the sinner that he came to see you. Tell him that you, that you need to be born of God. Tell him that, that you're anxious about your soul. You don't want to be lost. You want to be saved. And whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And like Lydia, you'll be saved. And your sins will be pardoned. And you'll be enabled to live day and daily for Christ. Look at verse 15. And when she was baptized... At her confessing her faith and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there, giving all the evidence of grace. For she was born of God. The Lord opened her heart. I wonder, will you come tonight? Again, just sitting where you are, will you ask the Lord to be your Saviour? And if you believe, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. That's by our heads in prayer. And the meeting will be over just in a moment, a moment or two. We're going to sing one more hymn. It's just really a short hymn. But again, let me renew that invitation to you. If you're outside of Christ, this is your trysting place. This is where you'll meet with them. And it would be an awful thing for you to go out of the meeting unconverted. We don't read of anybody else getting saved here. But there was a plurality of women there. He spake unto the women, which resorted thither. And there would have been those that would have left unconverted. And where are they tonight? That's the great issue. Father, thank you for your help tonight in the preaching of the word. Use it and bless it to every heart. In Jesus' name.
Amen. 316 is our closing hymn. I read in a few minutes, a trembling soul, I sought the Lord. My sin confessed, my guilt deplored. Oh, how soft, how sweet his word to me. I took thy place. I died for thee. 316. We'll sing it all. Stand to sing. Remain standing then for the benediction. us now with your blessing and in your fear, blessing of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. <laughs>